Chapter 1 of The Snarl of the Beast by Carol John Daly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 1 The Attack. It's the point of view in life that counts. For an ordinary man to get a bullet through his hat as he walked home at night would be something to talk about for years. Now, with me, just the price of a new hat, nothing more. The only surprise would be for the lad who fired the gun. He and his relatives would come in for a slow ride with a shovel full of dirt at the end of it. I can take a joke, of course, but my sense of humor isn't fully enough developed along those lines. I have brains, I suppose. We all have. But a sharp eye, a quick draw, and a steady trigger finger drove me into the game. Also, you might add to that an aptitude for getting out of trouble almost as quickly as I get into it. Under the laws, I'm labeled on the books and licensed as a private detective. Not that I'm proud of that license, but I need it, and I've had considerable trouble hanging on to it. My position is not exactly a healthy one. The police don't like me. The crooks don't like me. I'm just a halfway house between the law and crime, sort of working both ends against the middle. Right and wrong are not written on the statutes for me, nor do I find my code of morals in the essays of long-winded professors. My ethics are my own. I'm not saying they're good, and I'm not admitting they're bad. And what's more, I'm not interested in the opinions of others on that subject. When the time comes for some quick-drawing gunman to jump me over the hurdles, I'll ride to the pearly gates on my own ticket. It won't be a pass written on the back of another man's thoughts. I stand on my own two legs, and I'll shoot it out with any gun in the city. Any time, any place. 34th Street and Broadway, in the 5 o'clock rush hour, isn't barred either. Race Williams, private investigator, tells the whole story. Right, let's go. It's dark and the street lamps on the dirty little street of Lower East Side do no more than throw a dull shadow about a small splash of light. I'm not looking for trouble, but that don't mean that I'm not expecting it. I always am. I get as many death threats as a movie star gets mash notes. The rats of the underworld are my natural enemies. And there I am in the very heart of the criminal hangout. So I play close to the curb and throw a swagger into my walk. Outward confidence always registers with the unsavory gentleman of the night. There are few people pounding the pavements, some loitering in ill-smelling doorways beneath the street level. Nothing suspicious about any of them. That is, a personal suspicion. Yet I know that someone is getting my smoke. Someone is playing the lamb to my little Mary. Nothing tangible, you understand, and no way to explain it. Just instinct warns me that I am followed. It may be the police, or a crook with a guilty conscience, or just one of the boys who recognizes me and stalks along in the hope of settling a private vengeance by a bit of murder. Then another figure, running along the sidewalk across the street, beating his hands against the cold, is swallowed up in the darkness. I shrug my shoulders and plot on. I'm well known in that section of the city. A lad won't chance a shot unless he's so close he can't miss and the man following me knows that he'll only get one shot. While he holds his distance, there is no complaint. When he gets too close, I'll have to lead him down a back alley and kiss him good night. Nothing alarming. It's an old story to me. As I move nearer to the East River and a distant clock drones one, the lurking shadows of human forms disappear from the street. It's not the hour so much as the bitter cold. Somewhere below the level of the street, the tin-pan notes of a piano drift faintly into the night. A man curses, and a window slams. Far distant, an ash can clatters on the stone, and the almost human screech of a cat pierces, shrilling through the zero night. Then silence. But for the soft tramp of my rubber heels and the hardly audible echo of heels behind me, I don't have to turn to know that my shadow has quickened his pace and now takes two steps to my one, fast, short strides of a heavy body that swings from side to side. Things were getting interesting. I slipped off my thick gloves and wound my fingers about the heavy forty four in my coat pocket. Then I shot a glance back over my shoulder and caught the dull outline of the swinging figure who was unconsciously hurrying toward a yawning grave. Big, almost massive hunched shoulders, brown cap, and hands sunk in the pockets of a great coat that was wrapped tightly about his body. And that was all I saw of him. I turned back sharply again, for other feet sounded upon stone steps, then pounded over the pavement toward me. Just a derelict of the night he appeared, shuffling toward me. His right hand outstretched, his left 
hanging by his side with the palm toward me. He carried no weapon, there was no threat in his approach, and his manner was cringing. His body stooped, his voice with a whine in it. Two bits for a flop, mister. The voice was low and shook slightly. He didn't like the part he was playing, and I didn't blame him. The temptation to lift my gun and smack him one was strong, but I didn't. It wasn't a big heart or a sensitive conscience that made me hesitate. Just common sense and the hope of a long life. So I resisted temptation, put business before pleasure, and saved this bird a ride in an ambulance. I never had a doubt, wasn't fooled for a moment by the eager hand, the whining voice, and the sunken, hungry eyes. His hunger wasn't of the stomach. This was the slouching, running figure that had passed down the street at the last corner, and ducking across, had waited my approach in a convenient alleyway. Well planned, perhaps. It probably had worked hundreds of times before. But this time they were going to come a cropper. You couldn't pocket Race Williams between two enemies like that. Leastwise, you couldn't and get away with it. The thing was too simple. The panhandler was to hold my attention while my shadow was to spring me from behind. Believe me, I threw a monkey wrench into the works. I gave these birds a surprise. The shabby lad's hand was hardly out before the man behind changed his jerky walk to a run. But if he acted quickly, I was just a bit ahead of him. My left hand shot out and clutched the extended arm before me. My right pulled a rod, and before my whining friend was sure just what had happened, I was behind him, my gun playing a tattoo up and down his spine as he stood silently trembling between me and my rushing shadow. There was a curse as the big boy who had been shadowing me hurled himself forward skidded to a stop before he crashed his friend and stood still. A shadowy, mountainous mass in the darkness, but the hand that he still held in the air was clearly visible. So was the short section of iron pipe that white knotted fist held. Easy does it. I tried to peer over the shabby man's shoulder and get a look at the face beneath the brown cap. It was an ugly, evil map, what I could see of it. Gleaming, shining, animal-like eyes. Thick lips above heavy jowls that were lost in the collar of the great coat, which was buttoned tightly about his neck. But his arm was the thing. He had a reach on him like a gorilla. The lead pipe was high enough in the air, but that arm was slightly bent. It was the other that I noted, imagination I thought at first. Just a trick of the darkness as I made out the whiteness of thick twitching fingers reaching to the man's knees. But it wasn't imagination, for as I watched those fingers closed into a fist... A fist that slowly began to rise and stretch out beside the man whose back I tickled with my gun. Uncanny it was, there in the darkness. You couldn't really distinguish the arm that led from the hand to the shoulder. That was lost in the background of the dark coat. Just a knotted fist seemed to be floating through the air slowly, but surely and steadily toward me. The raised hand, too, was sweeping down by inches. Uncanny, certainly. Odd that a human being should have such a reach. But there was nothing to fear, really. An embarrassing time, perhaps, if I had to explain the shooting to the police. I've explained so often that it's getting monotonous to me. To the law, too, for that matter. Judges were looking at me with suspicion. Never anything to hang on me, you understand. But one learned jurist had told me grimly that if I made it a steady practice to appear before him to explain any more little shootings in the night, he'd give me a stretch on the principle of the thing. That he would was certain enough. That he could was another matter. But besides the annoyance, there was the expense of a high-class lawyer. Good mouthpieces may be worth the money, all right. And earn it, too. But they put an awful dig in the bank account just the same. And at present, my balance at the bank was about as low as the mercury in the thermometer. But, back to that hand. Young man, I shoved my gun deeper into the generous back before me. Advise your friend that if he isn't more careful of those... Itching fingers of his, I'll lay a row of lead buttons up and down your spine. Come, speak up. Those hands were still doing their stuff. One of them out by the derelict shoulders, the head of the awkward, waving creature shoved slightly forward, and his feet shuffled on the sidewalk. Lay off that stuff. The shabby man shot the words toward his companion. Was it a command or a request? I couldn't tell at first. The hand stopped for a moment, hung so by the other's shoulder. Then the fingers opened slightly and it came on again, the huge carcass moving slightly so that it was partly protected from me by the lad between us. Back, you! The panhandler jerked out the words, and there was no doubt of their meaning, neither a request nor a command, but a plea in his voice. And then again, You fool! Stop it! 
Drop those hands. Drop them, I say. And this time the whine in his voice was real. But there was more than just reality. Fear, horror were all in his screech. His words echoing down the street. He had lost his head altogether. Now he appealed to me. Don't shoot me, he cried, his words trembling and rattling in his throat. I, I can't stop him. I can't stop him. Look at his eyes. And I did. They were shining like an animal's, like a cat's. Clearly the green stood out in them. For the first time in my life I got a shudder. It was almost as if I could see things behind those eyes, as if I looked down into a reeking mass of rottenness. No way to describe it. I shuddered, yes, with revulsion, not fear. I'm not made to fear a man. It just don't come natural to me, I guess. But more than the eyes, I watch the hand, the heavy shoulders, the protruding head, the sudden outward thrust of a great chin. I swung my gun up and over the shoulder of the whiner. Listen, big boy, and there was no question nor pleading in my voice. If you don't control that laudable desire to fasten your hands on my neck and won't listen to the kindly fatherly advice of your dirty friend, and don't think anything of your life, why? And I cut my speech, for the man was swinging slowly from side to side, crouching slightly and getting ready to hurl that huge body forward. One more move and I'll plug the two of you, I said sharply, and I meant it. He, he don't understand, don't care, the other man bellowed. Lad won't stop him when he's like that. Nothing can stop him. Run for it, Race Williams, run! And this time his shout was fit to wake the dead. There may be men with charmed lives, men that Lad won't stop, but I have yet to meet them. The dirty lad may have been right. But if I were a betting man, I'd lay pretty good odds that at the first bark of my gun, a useless mass of flesh would lie on the sidewalk. It was his party, not mine. As for running, well, the bulletproof man who can pump lead into my dust isn't born yet. The giant didn't stop, didn't fade back as I poked my rod forward. And what's more, he didn't care much for his friend's life. He bent low, protecting his own body, shot his raised hand down, grasped his friend with it, and thrust that other hand out toward my neck. I could have given ground and avoided it, but I didn't. When I jump, I jump forward, not backward. I raised the muzzle of my gun slightly and pressed the trigger. A bullet tore up that flap and coat sleeve. Only a scratch it would give him, but it was the warning of a certain and sudden death to follow. His body may have been bulletproof, I didn't know about that, but his arm certainly wasn't and his brain was susceptible to pain. For the moment, I thought he wasn't a man at all. There was a grunt, an animal-like snarl, and an ear-splitting, agonized screech of rage. We just stood so, the three of us. The dirty lad, uncertain, his hands half-raised in the air. The terror was bent double, nursing his injured arm and giving queer groans and snarls. And I, I just swung my gun from one to the other, waiting. The show was on. Would they continue with the play or ring down the curtain? As for me, I just wanted a good look at that evil face that was buried in great arms, would I get that look? I thought not. This was New York, and gunshots were no novelty. They were expected, and we all three came erect. End of chapter one.